أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. Uh, bismillah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن ولا so let's get started uh people are ready inshallah bismillah um so we're going to shift into a new topic we've been looking at the practices around Ramadan because we just came out of Ramadan um we talked about fasting, we talked about some of the more internal parts of that. Um, we talked about Quran briefly. Um, but now we're going to be pivoting into prayer. And I know some of you were present when we talked about wudu and the how to's of wudu. If you missed that and you weren't here, we can definitely check in on that later. Um, but we're going to just go through with the assumption that that was a conversation that we already had. And you can find some of the video and the audio on that um, online. But that's going to be part of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to get into discussions on what is essentially a very foundational ritual within Islam as a tradition. And one of the key forms of worship that we have uh, between us and our Creator, which are five daily prayers, which in Arabic is called Salah. Um, and the idea etymologically within that form of prayer is that you're creating a link, a connection to God. Um, and today what we're going to talk about is not the actual mechanics of the prayer, but what are the conditions that need to be met outside of the prayer, uh, even before we start the prayer, for the prayer to be something that is valid when it's performed. Does that make sense? Um, so in Arabic, this word has a cognate in Urdu, Hindi, if people are familiar with those languages. Um, but it would be called a shart or shurut in plural. Like what are these conditions that you would need to have for the prayer's validity, um, but outside of it. And then next week we'll talk about what are the integral components, um, like the mandatory parts of the prayer itself, standing, a recitation of the Quran, you know, the bowing, etc. What are some of the things that are necessary components? Meaning if you didn't do them, it doesn't mean that the prayer is invalid, but you'd have to do what's called like a prostration of forgetfulness. Um, what are the things that are recommended and what are the things that are disliked in the prayer itself? But right now we're gonna just talk about things that are kind of outside of the prayer, but linked to it, that are conditions that have to be met before one goes into prayer. Does that make sense? Okay, so just really quickly again, um, as people are trickling in, if you want to take a minute, just introduce yourselves to the people sitting around you, and then we'll get started with just the first one and work our way through it. But yeah, if we just really quick intros to the people sitting around you. Um, and if you're online, if you want to just write in where you're coming from, um, introduce yourselves online as well, that would be great, inshallah. Great. So, if we just jump right into it, I wrote down these things on the board. I don't know if you can read my handwriting or not. Um, if you can't, I'll, just, I'll read them out loud. I apologize. Um, so, the first condition when we're approaching our salah is that you have to be pure from any ritual impurity from the beginning to the end of the prayer. Yeah. What do you mean by ritual impurity? We're going to talk about that right now. Yeah. So, you essentially need to be in a state of wudu, which we talked about for like 
about a month, if you remember. We went into wudu really deep, right? We talked about the spiritual aspects of it. We talked about the how-tos, what breaks it. But the condition for one to even come to enter into the prayer, condition number one is you're gonna need to be in a state of wudu. So you're not gonna be able to be in a place of what is major or minor ritual impurity, meaning if you went to the bathroom, you're not in a state of wudu at that point, right? If you passed wind, you're not in a state of wudu. If you went to bed for you know the night, you're not just dozing in a class or in a work meeting, but you knocked out and you're asleep, like if you wake up, you're gonna have to make wudu again. So point number one, is you're gonna be in a place where you're in a state of wudu and that has to last for the duration of the prayer as like a general principle, right? Now, what you wanna be able to do in this is that people have specific circumstances. We have people in our community, for example, who struggle with things like OCD. You know, they're in a place where the waswasa gets to them very deeply those specific circumstances you want to be able to talk to somebody about this is not a religion that shies away from wellness conditions if anything historically what we find is a deep understanding of the self in its entirety physical emotional spiritual mental and not just any one part to it but a recognition that where and how this tradition understands that everyone is not necessarily built to the same way. And why is that important? Because this gets a lot of people, just even in kind of the most uh, typical of circumstances, you'll have many people who are constantly in a state of doubt. Do I have my wudu? Do I not have my wudu? You know, did like something happen? Did something not happen? You want to be smart about this too, right? Condition number one, because it's from the beginning and the, to the end of the prayer. So you're going to meet like lots of Muslims, who are gonna be in a place where when you talk to them, they're just fidgeting a lot, they're moving around a lot as they're going to prayer and you're like, what's wrong with you? And they'll say, I have to go to the bathroom. And they'll say, well, why don't you go to the bathroom? And they'll say, I don't wanna redo my wudu again and I'm gonna have to pray maghrib in a little bit. And they're like literally dancing around, squirming, trying to hold everything in. That's not how you want to approach your prayer. Do you know what I mean? If you understand that this is something that has to be from start to finish of the prayer and you want to maintain that state without any distraction, then just deal with whatever it is that's going to come up that you know is going to be there that allows for you to have a peace of mind. But wudu is something that has to be present in order for you to approach the salah. Does that make sense? Yeah, and we talked about wudu a lot. You don't have to redo your wudu every time you pray. But if you break your state of wudu, then that has to be redone before you can enter into the prayer. Yeah. What if you can't remember if you have it or not? So the default is we have uh, in our tradition things, in our, in our legal tradition, there's things that are called maxims. And there's one that says, certainty is not lifted by doubt. So if you know you made wudu, and you're kind of wondering, do I still have it or not? You go with what was certain that you made the wudu. Does that make sense? Yeah. But something comes up, right? Or you talk to your friends or people in your family. My kids are seven and 10, and they are just like any seven and 10 year old. Most of you probably met them during Ramadan or saw them running around, right? They're really nice kids, mashallah. Anytime I say to my kids when we're going to pray together as a family, hey, do you have wudu? No matter what, the first answer is always yes, right? And I'm like, how? How do you still, how do you, when did you even do it, right? And they're like, well, let me think about it. You know, and my son will say, you know, I took Baba like a, a bath like 12 hours ago. And I'm like, bro, what are, you, what are you talking about, right? My son will go through that process, my daughter will, but they'll sit and they'll think about it. But for some of us, we just fundamentally get to a place where doubt gets the best of us. You don't want to give in to doubt. You want to be in a place where what's certain is what you go off of. And then if you think about it, right, you trace your steps, you kind of do your best. 
Um, and that's really kind of where it's at. But you don't want to prevent like focus and kind of gain from the prayer because what you know could disrupt your wudu, you're not dealing with it out of just kind of laziness or exhaustion or reasons that don't make any sense. Number two, and we're not gonna go into that too deeply because we talked about wudu for so long. So if you trickled in, as we're going through this, we have like the videos and the audio up on our podcast. I'm happy to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. We'll likely circle back to this when we start all over again the next time we do this. Um, but don't let the idea that you missed like a session or two be something that prevents you from it. We can walk through it and talk about it um, if people are not familiar with it and the ways that we were doing it so that it's strategic, right? You're trying to make wudu in the workplace, in the classroom. So we went deep as opposed to just a list so you can know, well, in these situations, these are the ways that I can adapt. Number two, the body and clothing has to also be free from any types of impurities. And this might be something that you feel like is a given, but for example, um, making wudu in and of itself is not necessarily the same as ensuring that, okay, like I've washed from my body anything of urine or fecal matter, or I'm in a place, for example, where my clothes might have something on it that are considered to be, from a, a religious standpoint, impure, that I want to make sure those clothes are also clean. <laughs> Clothing in our tradition relates to the body in a way that what constitutes clothing is that when you are wearing it, it actually like moves with your body. Does that make sense? So for example, if you're wearing your shoes and you took off your shoes and then you stood on top of your shoes while you were praying, then you're not wearing your shoes. Do you get what I mean? Your shoes are now kind of beneath your feet, but they're not they're still clothing, but they're not clothing that you're wearing at that point in time, right? I have on a jacket. If I take my jacket off and I put it down, and we get into point three for a clean place of prayer, what I'm wearing has to be something that is also free of impurity. But if you're not wearing it, right, you take your shoe off, and at the heel or the base of your shoe, there's something that is not clean, but what you're standing upon is clean, then you're still preying on something that is clean. Do you get what I mean? It's the equivalent of if you took a prayer mat and you put it down on the ground where there's a lot of filth, but you're preying on something clean, and that's like the clean area. Do you, do you get what I mean? Yeah. What's the feeling if like you come from like the gym and you're like sweating, is that like impure? No, okay. sweat is clean, right? In the sense that like it's it's, not one of the things that are considered, yeah. I have another question that's maybe silly, but I was thinking like if you pray outside, like when you put your prayer mat down and then like it's dirty, but like on the bottom half, like you know, just like the road in the wash or do Yeah, you... we're gonna talk about it when we get to three, okay. which is a clean place of prayer. But your prayer mat isn't your clothing because it's just, it's a mat that doesn't move as you move. Do you get what I mean? So your clothes have to be clean and free of any kind of impurity and your body also has to be cleansed of any kind of impurity. Yeah. The default of things are that they're clean unless you have a reason to believe that they're not clean, right? Um, so if you're walking and you step in New York City there's like a dog that just peed in front of you, right? And you didn't, you mit, you know, you, you stepped in it. Then you, one of the reasons why we're removing shoes quite often in masjids is because shoes can track a lot of things of dirt and jessa and this kind of stuff. But if you're in a place where people will have different perspectives on some of these things, some people will say, you gotta take those shoes off no matter what. And some people will say, if you're outside and you're not aware of like, what you're praying in or whatever, or it's cold outside, it's snowing outside, these kinds of things. But fundamentally, um, the idea isn't that just because you're wearing a shoe outside, that what is accumulating on it is going to be 
from a religious standpoint, considered impure. Do you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and these are things that you're going to see. Different people will do them in different ways. Uh, and when you're praying individually, you are going to pray kind of in accordance with what you know you are going to make that decision for yourself. Do you know what I mean? Um, and we talked about wudu, for example. If you remember, I use the example of my Tims. And like I wear them purposely when I travel on planes because they constitute all of the requirements of what you can wipe over when you're making wudu. So you don't have to remove your socks and remove your shoe in your entirety because the boot goes above the ankle. You can walk a certain distance in it. It's not perforated or permeable by water. You know, all those things that we discussed. So in order for me to be able to pray with that condition, I'd have to keep that shoe on. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. The body and the clothing must be free from impurity. You also just want to be smart, like what you're wearing. And we're going to talk about wearing clothes here that cover the body in a certain way. But here too, like just be smart about what you're wearing in the course of the prayer, right? Shouldn't be something that is, you can come in, man. Yeah. Um, isn't something that, you know, has like any kind of vulgar language on it, right? You don't want something that's like, you know, the person praying behind you is going to be kind of distracted as they're reading, like whatever's written on your back, or they're like, what is this guy wearing to pray? You know, because you're in a state of prayer. You want like the clothes to also be something that um, are going to be indicative of like, hey, I'm standing in front of God right now. Do you know? I'm in this place where the entire experience is not just a prayer of the body, but it's a prayer of my heart. You know, I don't want to just be in a state where my body's prostrating and bowing, but my heart is also prostrating and bowing. So you think out when you go to do anything, what helps you to get into a mindset? You're going for an interview of some kind. You're going to go meet you know, the person you want to marry, their parents for the first time. You're going to be in a place where you're getting yourself ready and presentable. And so where there's an understanding that also you want to allow for yourself to fall into kind of a mindset that is as integrated into the prayer as best as possible by like wearing clothes that are indicative of, hey, this is like the act that I'm engaging in. How is how I present myself to it something that gives me an insight onto what I really deem it to be in terms of importance, you know? So if I roll out of bed at fudger time and I just am in like my pajamas, the same thing I slept through, I like throw some water on my face and I just do some variation of standing and going up and down and up and down, you're gonna get out of it what you put into it, you know what I mean? But I've met people who for their entire lives, they have like just a prayer outfit that they have in their home, you know? And it takes like two seconds for them to throw it on even if what they're wearing is totally fine. Like what everybody's wearing right now, you know, nothing is like inappropriate as such, but you get to a place where you're like, this is what I wear when I stand in front of God. Do you know? I put some mindfulness into it, some thoughtfulness into it. Do you know what I mean? It might not be as easy when you're out in the workplace, you're in class, you're trying to navigate some of it, but when you're at home, you're there, you have more of a comfortability, you're going to the mosque, you're going to gatherings where there might be other Muslims and you know they're gonna pray, and you're in a place where you can anticipate that where some of the day might be a little bit more hectic, here's now an opportunity for me to engage this at moments of ease that allow for this to increase some of the presence. Do you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah, go ahead. It's my son. I have a question, a crazy question, but uh, like for instance, one of my part-time jobs uh, does work with a lot of dispensaries, and I help them with their businesses and stuff like that, advertising. But I, you know, smelling like marijuana is something that's you know kind of don't really know how to go about that. I mean, I understand what you're saying and the principle of like presenting myself towards God, but you know, uh, what is like the I guess baseline on how you smell? I'm not high, but I do smell like marijuana. It's not like we can talk about that separately more, but just to give you an idea, for example, like I own a butchery, you know, I know people know that. And when we open the butchery, 
me and my partners, I told them we should learn every part of what goes into butchering. Um, and so for a butcher, for example, because of the nature of their work, there's an exception made in terms of the clothing that they wear because it's going to at some point have like certain things that the norm is you shouldn't be wearing that kind of stuff, right? Um, or there's other things that we'll talk about when we talk about clothing, for example. Um, in the Hanafi school, there are two opinions for a woman what's considered an aura in terms of her forearm showing, right? And some of what they say in the Hanafi school is that because there's certain tasks that women would do on a daily basis, they could be, you know, in medicine, like doing things or work that necessitates them having like forearms exposed, that there's indication that in those specific situations, if a forearm is exposed, it's not the same as if just, you know, the normal course of action is that um, it should be covered. Do you get what I mean? Um, but let's talk about that offline. You know, and see kind of you know where where we can land on that particularly. But those are certain things that do come up in certain regards, right? It's not the norm, you know. Even with fasting, for example, you know there were people who, if you look at fic books, people whose jobs was to like harvest food and work very deeply, laboriously, were sometimes given the exemption from fasting if they weren't able to perform their job because of the fast and their job had a time sensitivity to it. So if they didn't harvest the crop at the time that they needed to, then like they wouldn't have anything to eat and people wouldn't have anything to eat. You know, so the specificities of it though are not kind of devoid of what the normal principle is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was kind of playing with that in my mind. Like, if, you know, I worked with my brother painting houses over the summer, right? Scraping lead, lead paint. I'm thinking if I, you know, wash up as much as I can, but I got dust on me or whatever, and the intersection of like intention and circumstance, right? If it's not your like all the time or like, or the bar that you set to be covered in dust. But it's whatever. not a problem. Like if yeah, you had dust yeah. and paint on you, those aren't things that are considered ritually impure, okay. right? And there's actual hadith where the prophet says that God loves to see his servant come to him, you know, in this kind of state of, of need, you know, in certain ways. Right? There's like you're still well groomed. Doesn't mean when you're going to pray, just like take a bucket of dirt and throw it on you. Right? That's not the idea. But even when you're on Hajj, for example, you know, you're in Hajj, you're in your ahram, the white clothing. If you've ever seen like pictures or if you guys saw pictures of Mecca from Ramadan where people are praying around the Kaaba and the last nights of Ramadan or on the day of Eid, on that first like area around the Kaaba, they only let people in right now who are performing Umrah. Um, the smaller pilgrimage. So the men are all in the white garb. Um, on Hajj, you wear that for a series of days, you know, and you're getting covered in dirt and dust and all these things. Those things aren't problematic, right? Um, so when we talked about what makes wudu and what are these things that, from a religious standpoint, are considered substantively impure, if those things are on your clothing or on your body, you want to remove those things. Um, and cleanse yourself of them um, as a condition for the prayer, right? And if these conditions aren't met, what we're saying is the validity of the prayer is not met then, right? The prayer in and of itself is not valid at that point. A clean place of prayer is the third that you would need, right? So it's, I'm getting ready to pray. What are the things that I need in order to pray? So in the Hanafi school, these are the conditions that you need in order to pray. A clean place of prayer, the default is that everything is clean unless there's a reason to believe that it's not clean. Does that make sense? So you could go and pray on the sidewalk right outside the building. You can go to Washington Square Park and you can pray over there. You can go and pray... There's like men who drive taxi cabs that literally pray on the hoods of their taxi cabs. They can pray over there. The default is that things are assumed to be clean unless there's a reason to believe or understand that they're not clean, right? The physical presence of something, the discoloration, the smell, you know, these are the kinds of things that would give us indication, you know? And if you're in a place where you like literally see something in front of you, then that's what 
you have to go off of. Yeah. What's the ruling of like having the prayer mat? Is that like what the mat is required? All the prayer mat is is that you essentially are carrying with you now something that is a clean place to pray, um, but it's not a requirement as such, right? And it's not something that's sanctified. It's not like a sacred object in that way. Um, and so to go back to Anna's question, like when you have a prayer mat and you're putting it down, some people are very meticulous when they fold up the prayer mat so that when you fold it, the underside is not touching the top side. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Right? So you can fold it in a bunch of different ways. Like you could roll it up and then the underside will touch the top side. Doesn't mean if the underside touched the top side, like the prayer mat is ruined. No, like that's not what it means, right? But when you see people being very meticulous with it, what they're doing is they're avoiding the bottom from touching the top because you could put down a prayer mat. It doesn't mean like the whole place in the whole like space has to be clean. Just the place where you are praying and the parts of your body that are going to touch the ground, those places have to be free of anything that's considered to be ritually impure, right? So if I went and prayed in Washington Square Park near the dog park, and there's all kinds of things around the dog park, but like right where I'm praying is clean, that in and of itself is still a clean place for me to pray. The Hadith says that the entire world is a masjid, you know? So you can pray like more or less theoretically wherever you would want to, but you have to ensure that the place in and of itself is also a clean place. Yeah. Um, so like usually, you know, I carry like a scarf with me, but there are times I don't. So is it better to like wait when I have the scarf with me to pray or like pray without one? Like a scarf for like what? A, like, a, like a scarf. So like cover your hair? Yeah, we're going to talk about next like what clothes you have to wear. But we're going to, um, we'll get to that in the fourth point. Yeah. Will you list uh, exactly what uh, substances are considered impure? We talked about it in wudu. We can go through it again if people want to, um, in terms of what would be <coughs> impure. Yeah, that would be helpful. <coughs> yeah, and that's what I was saying before too. If you missed some of those sessions, we can like talk it out one on one. You can find the audio and video <coughs> online, but I'll put up a list also um, so that people know what those things are. What were you gonna say? Actually, it's on that topic. Um, I was just wondering if you could provide clarity on the cleanliness of animal fur and then of like dog saliva so i've had some muslims be like oh if a dog licks you you have to do a whistle and i don't know if that's true can i still pray no you don't have to do a whistle right yeah. so there are different opinions on like the saliva of the dog mm -hmm. right um and where the saliva in and of itself is considered to be ritually impure um, and if you come into contact with it, what you have to do is just wash it, you know? The recommended washing of the clothing, your body part, etc. You'd want to wash the clothing like, um, you know, seven times, three to seven times is kind of like a recommended kind of range. But rinsing it through once, like where the water is flowing through it, just that part if the dog saliva touches it. And then by extension, the saliva you know, because of the nature of the animal that they'll say if like the dog brushes against you or its fur brushes against you, but you don't have to do a whistle if you have a dog lick you or touch you. Um, then there's other opinions that distinguish between domesticated dog versus a wild dog, right? That um, the idea would be that animals that you were training for hunting, for example. So a dog would be utilized as one of the animals that would hunt with and when the hunter would send out the dog to retrieve the animal that was hunted, right? And hunting is not done for sport in Islam. You can't just kill something because you feel like killing it. You know, this is done out of a necessity, like for food. Um, and the Prophet ﷺ was not someone who was known to eat meat every day, right? So the idea was that he wouldn't go 40 days in a row eating meat, but he also didn't go 40 days without eating it. A lot of people who are vegetarian, vegan, people are in places where that's acceptable from within our tradition, but you're not like going to kill for the sake of killing. Does that make sense? So when this dog is now sent, 
by the hunter, the dog is bringing the animal back in its mouth, right? So this creates like a scenario that says, okay, if the saliva of the dog is problematic and considered ritually impure as a default, right? What are things that are ritually impure? Like wine is ritually impure, you know? Uh, urine is ritually impure. So if somebody was to mix that into food, for example, is considered just impure because its default state is impurity. If the dog's saliva, we're saying, is impure in that way, then it's problematic now that it's bringing the food back in its mouth. And so there's opinions that distinguish between the domesticated animal and the non-domesticated animal. All right, and what they would say is, you know, subhanAllah, like knowledge is such an empowering mechanism in Islam as a tradition that even the animal that has knowledge is given more of a status than the animal that does not have knowledge, right? Um, but if you get something on your clothes, you know, like a dog licks your hand, just wash that part of your hand. If the dog, like, you know, licked your jacket, you just wash that part of the jacket. You don't have to, like, throw the whole jacket in, right? And it's varied. You know, some of you are still exploring Islam, some of you are new to Islam, some of you are born in Muslim families. You'll meet Muslims, right? I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. They'll see like a dog come in front of them and they will like freak out as if the worst thing in the world is like coming their way, right? It's just a dog, you know what I mean? You don't have to run away from it. If anything, if you run from it, it's gonna likely think you're playing with it. It's gonna start chasing you and you're just making yourself worse, right? And if something like kind of comes towards you, and you're engaged in that opinion that its saliva, its fur, you know, is something that renders najasa, then, like, it's fine. You just wash it off, you know? It's not, you don't want to use the opportunity to then start, like, you know, kind of grilling somebody. You know, your dog is the worst thing in the world, right? It's a dog. It's just being a dog. That's what dogs do. They're playful. They're, like, very loyal, mashallah. The Quran speaks about a dog as being a companion of the people of the cave in the chapter that's called Surat al-Kahf, right? Um, and so there's a lot that goes into it. And something that I think we talked about, but I'll say again, you don't have to know a lot to be Muslim, right? But there's certain like soundbite pieces of information that Muslims have that they don't know where it comes from. And so when you convert to Islam, they're gonna give you this list of things and one of those things is gonna be about dogs probably, right? There's different opinions on it. Um, and where you might come into contact with a dog or somebody who's a dog owner, like that's fine. There's room for that in Sharia. Um, and there's opinions that say the domesticated dog is fine. And there's others who would say no, like by the default it's not. And they would still make room for it saying like, you should have a guard dog, right? The dog can stay outside in your yard, they're protecting. Right? If you're a shepherd, many shepherds have sheep dogs. They're there also to protect from predators. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. Um, so what time is Mugger? Oh, sorry. What time is Mugger? 747. 747? Yeah, go ahead. So I have a pet cat, right? Is his hair uh, Najasa? No, cats are fun. Okay, so yeah. Dogs are also mentioned in the feast. Huh? Dogs are mentioned in the feast. Yeah, dogs they're there. Dogs and birds for hunting. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. And you don't need to redo wudu, right? If the dog licks you, you just wash the area with water. You just wash the area. Okay. Yeah, you can wash it. So where you have a clean place of prayer, like you want to establish this also in your homes. You want to think about it in the course of your day because you're getting yourself also mentally ready, right? Like, where am I going to pray this prayer? And this can really mess around with a lot of people. And it can create like anxiety. I was having dinner with a friend of mine in Times Square and Times Square is Times Square, you know? <laughs> but I'm at a point where I'm pretty comfortable praying in most places. So I just went around the corner, prayed on the sidewalk, and then a tour bus parked in front of me. And like 55 people walked out from this tour bus. And I'm in my prayer, I can't stop. I started, you know, praying. I didn't know what was gonna happen. And while I'm in prayer, a woman came and walked really close to where I was, and she then took a scarf off from around her neck and put it down where I was prostrating. And then by the time I finished, they had all left. 
So I didn't get a chance to like talk to her, like speak to her to say thank you. It was really nice. It's probably not like the normal experience that's gonna happen. Do you know what I mean? So a lot of the agitation that comes that isn't necessarily about, let me find a clean place of prayer. Embedded in finding a clean place of prayer is the idea that you're already situating yourself with a recognition of like, where am I going to pray? You know, in the course of my day, I know that I'm in this building at this time. I'm, you know, in this part of the office building at this time. Like, how do I preemptively understand what the next day is going to look like so that I'm able to execute on this and that I'm now not in a place where I am limiting myself, but I'm able to perform the prayer as best as it can be. We're gonna talk about the integrals of prayer, the faraid. If you remember, we did like the spectrum of what every act can fall into, obligatory, recommended, you know, impermissible, etc. that thing. And if you weren't here, we'll, we'll go through it again. Don't be overwhelmed by it, we'll go through it if you miss those classes. Um, one of the things that are required to do in your prayer is like in your obligatory prayer, you gotta stand in the prayer, right? If you're like confined to an airplane and there's not room, like there's differences and we'll talk about that when we talk about how to pray when you're traveling. But when you are thinking about it, right? You don't wanna get caught off guard that I'm stuck on Fifth Avenue, the sun is setting, Mugger's about to finish, I'm just gonna grab some jeans off of a rack and find an empty dressing room that doesn't allow for me to go through the movements of the prayer fully. If you can make it work in the prayer, like in the, in the dressing room, that's fine, right? Because it's still a clean place, but you want to be in a place where these things are things that you're thinking about prior to, but not like two minutes before the prayer, right? But thinking about it well before so that it's actually like a replenishing act and it doesn't become then very burdensome and anxiety inducing. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I have a question. I've seen like, you know, you're able to just, like you said, like indeed, like the world is your masjid. Is it like the same for women and for men? Because I feel like, is it just like based off your comfort or is it okay for like a woman to like just be praying out anywhere? where like people could see them, I don't know. I think you want to consider your safety more than anything, do you know? And be in a place also where you're not creating anxiety for yourself. But the prayer times, which we're gonna talk about in the fifth group, are things that we know in advance. Do you know what I mean? So where and how you're preemptively understanding, hey, I'm going to be in these areas around this time of prayer, right? Like when I pray in an airport or pray in the street, if I have a bag with me, right, I'm going to put it in front of me because I need to be able to watch my stuff too, you know? It's not like, oh, I'm praying, let me just throw my laptop bag behind me. And then I turn around, it's like, who took my shoes? Who took my stuff? It's like, well, why did you put it somewhere where nobody, you know what I mean, right? So similarly, like, you got to just be mindful for yourself. Like, where is the place that I'm going to pray that I have comfort, that I can feel like a sense of security and safety? The idea in and of itself that you're not in a prayer place is not enough of a reason to say that you don't pray and it's time. So you're going to pray in the course of the time period unless there's like an extenuating circumstance which doesn't really come for most of us. Do you know what I mean? Like what would constitute that type of situation? Does that make sense? Yeah. But all of this is about not getting caught off guard. Do you know, right? Because the prayer itself, when we talk about the mechanics and what goes into it, it takes just a few minutes to actually do, especially when you're praying on your own. But what gets a lot of people are all of these things that are taking place around the prayer itself. You know, so the more you can think out, okay, like how am I gonna have my wudu when it's time to pray? And am I like in a place where what I'm wearing and like my body, is it clean? So when I'm using the bathroom, am I washing up properly from that? And where are the actual places that I have designated in the course of my day that are gonna help me to pray? It's really hard for a lot of our college students, right? I know all of you aren't college students here, but when you can just 
walk into a room that's built for you versus you now go into the world and you try to figure out how to be Muslim out there in a world that's not sensitive to your Islam always, right? You're trying to figure out how do I do this with my job and how do I do this you know, with coworkers and all of these kinds of things where you're able to then think about it beyond just the moment you find yourself in. Do you know what I mean? And you start to think out like there's windows to these prayer times. There are like ways that I can create for myself clean places of prayer that would allow for me to understand like still a little bit of autonomy in the course of it. Because whether I'm in a class or I'm at work or I'm hanging out with friends, the time to pray is upon you, that window. You got to pray the prayer in that window of time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any questions on these first three things? Yeah. Um, I wanted to kind of discuss like um, praying and then uh, like praying with them, like the idea of also like bathrooms. I know it's like a kind of something that people like to look into. I don't know if I might go into that now or anything or if you thought about it. Before. You shouldn't pray in a bathroom because it's a bathroom, you know? But given the nature of the audience that we have here, right, it's people learning about Islam, people who are new Muslims, there's converts that I know who they write to me and they say, I live with a family that hates Islam. You know, Muslims don't really reach out to me or I'm the only Muslim. When I go back home to like my Bible Belt family, my Midwest family, my like, you know, Western Texas family, and the only place that I can find like a place of quiet is in the restaurant bathroom when we're out to eat dinner or, you know, in my home in the restroom, right? These are specifics, do you know what I mean? But where and how individually, we have like a lot more probably room to be flexible. And if you think about this in terms of the convert experience, where even despite those challenges, they're still like staying committed to their faith. And a lot of people who are born into Islam, quite often we just take for granted like some of the privileges that we've been afforded. Do you know what I mean? So you want to be in a place where like you're at work, you got to like tell your boss, you kind of need to have a place to pray, right? You can't go into a stall and pray in the bathroom over there. Do you know what I mean? Right? It's a place that is definitively like of impurity, you know? Um, you find like empty meeting rooms, these kinds of things. Um, okay, so we went through the first three of these. These are conditions of the prayer, according to the Hanafi school, um, outside of like the prayer. When you're coming to the prayer, these are things that have to be met as conditions before you pray the prayer, right? So we talked first, you gotta be in a state of wudu from the start to the end of the prayer, right? So if we were praying right now and I broke my wudu, I would have to go and redo my wudu in order for the prayer to be valid. And unless there is an extenuating circumstance, which is not the majority of us, right? So you want to take the exceptions out and just understand the norm. Somebody has like some kind of ailment or condition that impacts how they retain kind of, you know, urine in their body, for example, or, you know, they have kind of just excessive dripping that comes, um, or, you know, their ability to control kind of um, releasing of gas or anything like that, you know, but those are things that you would engage in kind of a conversation with both a religious scholar as well as a doctor who could give you an idea as to what's really going on there. And then there's particulars that might come up. That's not necessarily applicable to us in a general sense. Do you know what I mean? So we'll do, you want to make sure your body and clothing are also clean. If we we're talking about what constitutes um, an impure substance. So what we would find here are things like urine, fecal matter, wine is considered an impure substance, um, blood, uh, things that would also come from animals in these regards as well, um, uh, seminal fluid, um, pre-seminal fluid, sperm, you know, these are all things that are considered um, inherently impure. In order for that now, in point number two, to be something that creates a challenge for us, 
the transference has to be something that also takes place. So if you have like a dry substance and it doesn't transfer to you because it's dry, then it's dry. But if it's wet, then the transference comes more into contact with you. Does that make sense, right? But at a baseline, like don't pray any place where there's pee on the ground, right? Don't pray any place where a dog just pooped, you know? And if you have a mat with you, you can put a mat down. All mats aren't like big and thick. You can get really thin ones, traveling ones. Um, and the places where your body is touching the ground is where it has to be clean. So that's not like, you know, I need a 10 foot radius around me to kind of be, but just in the place where you're gonna be performing your prayer and your limbs that touch the ground. We'll talk about this as we go through the mechanics of the prayer, like how your body is positioned and what parts of your body need to be touching the ground, which ones should not be touching the ground, but a clean place, um, your body in clothes free of impurity and a clean place of prayer, meaning that the place that you're praying is free also of these impurities. And you want it to be a place where also um, it's now not, the cleanliness of it is attached to the validity, right? So this is outside of the validity, but for example, you know, you could go and pray in a place that you know purposely is just going to be fundamentally distracting for you, right? There's all kinds of sound and noise circulating. You just wanna try your best, right? We're in New York City, right? The noise doesn't necessarily stop in too many parts of the city. We were praying Zohar earlier. <laughs> there was some kind of party going on in Washington Square Park, right? Um, we prayed Eid in the park on Friday. I don't know how many, how many of you here were on, on Eid with us in the park? It's really nice, right? Alhamdulillah. The night before, on April 20th, it was like a crazy party in the park. Do you know what I mean? We're praying here, we have a beautiful view of the park, but whatever happens in the park, even if it's not a party, Bernie Sanders campaign in the park, there's like hundreds of thousands of people in the park. Obama spoke in the park. We get front row seats every time this happens. You can just sit outside the window and see whatever's happening in the park. But all that noise is gonna carry in to the room. Does it mean that the validity of the prayer is attached to that. The cleanliness is here in that sense, like in terms of what is physically clean. So outside of that, you wanna just do your best to also make sure that you're not situated in places that are going to be very distracting and kind of draw your attention away. Does that make sense? So we're gonna move into the fourth um, bucket here. Um, there's a lot of comments in here. I'll read through them as well. So when we get to, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to ask, uh, when we talked about how the bathroom is kind of a place to like kind of adjust some things like that, we wouldn't pray in a bathroom. Um, would that, would the validity change at all if someone brought a prayer mat into the bathroom? You should try to avoid praying in the bathroom, right? We talked about this when we talked about wudu, because a lot of us make wudu in the bathroom, right? A lot of our showers and bathtubs are attached to the bathroom. So I have teachers who have said that the functionality of the space in and of itself, you know, switches in that moment, right? And it's now not a bathroom, but it's, you know, something different. When you go for Hajj, for example, the unit that the bathroom is in also has a shower head over it. So the toilet and the shower is all in one kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? But unless there's like a reason as to why one would, and we can talk about it more offline if you want, you know, just so we can understand the intricacies of it. But pretty much like the default of bathrooms is that you don't, you're, you shouldn't be praying in the bathroom. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. No, you have to stop and make your wudu, okay. right? Because you can't, you need to be in wudu to pray your prayer. And um, then, um, if you go on an airplane, like say overseas, like do you just pray in the airplane? Or like yeah, we'll talk about, but yeah, you have to pray when the prayer time comes in, in the plane, in real time. So it's not like from the place you left or the place you're going to. 
but in so when you're flying east right the prayers are going to come really fast you know because you're going across time zones when you fly west like you're just making up hours right so when we went for umrah to mecca it was like a lot of prayers back to back to back to back but when we left from saudi to come back to new york we <laughs> didn't pray anything right because it was just fundamentally like just a really long like kind of just situated in like the mid-afternoon for hours because we were flying westward and we were making up hours do you know what i mean yeah well we'll talk about this when we talk about prayer when we're traveling but essentially if i'm praying i have to do as much of it as i can in the ways that it's intended the obligatory prayer the far the prayer right so when you're in your seat like if you can't prostrate but you still can stand so you're going to stand and we're going to talk about facing the kaaba in a bit but you're going to face the qibla and all the standing parts you should be able to do when you're in your seat because there's still room for you to stand in the seat right if now you're sitting and you can't prostrate because there's no place to prostrate then you're going to just you know do your rukur by like if you're seated you're going to put your hands on your knees and bend a little and then for such that you're going to go down a little bit more and then when you're in your kneeling position you're going to have your hands rested on your knees still seated do you get what i mean but then the second rakah you stand up again do you know um does that make sense and you can find places in the plane and some airlines have like prayer areas um some places you just talk i fly all the time there's like some planes i fly on that there's no room for anything, you know? It's like literally seats and seats and the aisleway is this small and there's there's nothing, you can't do anything. You still gotta pray your prayer and it's time when it's there and you do it to the best of your ability. Um, and there's other planes where there's a lot more room um, and you know, you wanna just still fundamentally try your best. Tell the attendant what you're doing so that no one is like kinda like what is happening here right now and ask them if there's a place that you can and if they say no that's also totally fine just go back to your seat and you do what you can do over there yeah yeah go ahead Yeah, you have to pray. Yeah, you know, you'd have to still pray. Like, and you, what you could do is, like, use different substances to clean the clothes. Um, like the, the dirt, the dust, these kinds of things. Um, carry water with you, like, pre-plan, you know, in different ways if possible. Um, but you still have to pray, like, the prayer in the circumstance. And what is preventing you from praying might then require to repeat a prayer. But the specifics of that, so that it doesn't become complicated, you know, we can talk about in, a, in another time, or I'm happy to talk to you about it separately. Yeah, um, go so ahead, and then we'll keep going. No, like, if you're on a flight, mm -hmm. right, I'm flying from New York to London, yeah. you know? And I have to pray Maghrib. Maghrib is prayed at the time it comes in while I'm on the plane. Not like at the time it comes in at New York or at the time it comes in at London. Like in real time when I'm in the plane, I pray those prayers and then you're done. So if you prayed, like we could pray Fajr when we're leaving Saudi Arabia. And then on our layover, we prayed Dhuhr. Maybe somebody prayed Asr, they combined prayers. But then you might not pray anything for 12 hours coming back to the States because you're just in that prayer time for the next 10, 12 hours because you're making up the hours because you're going west, right? You're, the time zones are kind of going back. You know, like California's three hours at, behind, uh, behind us. You see what I mean? Yeah, go ahead. Say you like forget a prayer, should you make it up later? Yeah, let's talk about that when we talk about making up prayers, yeah. Um, a question about the 
real time, how do you know all of them? Because most of the apps that like, I have are connected via internet, so when you're on airplane mode, it just defaults to where. You should plan before you leave and just know what the flight pattern is. And we're gonna talk about the prayer times so that you, you start to learn how to tell the time of the prayers from the sun, um, which isn't really as hard as one might assume that it is, right? It's, it's everything in our religion that everyone is entitled to access is purposely like very easy. So none of it's supposed to be unnecessarily complicated, right? Like some of, many of you are converts, some of you are thinking about Islam, to become Muslim, you just say the Shahada. That's it. There's no prerequisite course of study. It's not about so-and-so validated your Islam or this or that, whatever. You only say the Shahada because anybody can be Muslim if they want to be. Regardless of their culture, their race, their class, their ethnicity. It's purposefully a very simple process because anybody can do it if they want to. If it was very complicated, it would pose undue hardship on people because we're so diverse, right? So the ability to determine, but also the leeway that you have when you're making these determinations is things that we're gonna talk about in a bit, right? Like when we talk about facing the Qibla, the Kaaba, right? You could tell that from the sun, but it's very different if you're standing in front of the Kaaba or you're at a masjid that is right in front of the Kaaba and everything's oriented versus you're in the middle of New York City and you're trying to figure out the direction to pray. Like that's where there's kind of leeways on some of these things and you want to know those so that you're not giving yourself anxiety or headaches on things. Let's just continue and then we'll go. Okay, so we're going to talk about what you have to cover when you're in the prayer, right? So before you dress for prayer or before you enter the prayer, you have to be dressed in the clothes that you're going to be wearing through the duration of the prayer. For men, what is called the aura, right, which gets translated as like nakedness but it's not really like a good translation if you're reading things online essentially like the parts of your body that we're talking about this only in prayer right so this word can exist in different settings too what has to be covered in front of people who are you know certain relatives of yours people who are of the same gender background as yours what has to be covered in front of people who are not your relatives, people you could essentially be married to potentially, these kinds of things, right? They all have like different kind of nuances to it. So we're only talking about this in the course of prayer. Does that make sense? In your salah, this is what has to be covered for a man and a woman as a condition for the prayer. So for men, this is from below your navel to below your knee, including the knee. And for women, it's everything in the Hanafi school except your face, your hands, and your feet. So what constitutes now an understanding of the covering of it, like loose clothing, things that are not transparent, they're not like see-through, and things that are going to remain covering you throughout the course of the prayer, right? This happens with a lot of men, for example, where we're dressed in clothes that when you bend over, they weren't made for you to bend over like that, right? And I like lined up people in prayer throughout Ramadan, and there's a lot of guys who I was seeing things I did not want to see, man. You know what I mean? But from the standpoint of this, that then breaks the validity of your prayer. And the mechanics of these are not things to undermine. What you're gonna see is a common thread through a lot of what our ritual is based on is the cultivation of just awareness and consciousness. You're conscious of, are you in a state of wudu or not? Is my body free of any like impurities or not? Is the place that I'm praying in clean or not, right? The mechanics in and of themselves, they're giving you wakefulness before you come to the prayer. So you're not just in a place where it's, I'm in a daze and I'm just gonna go up and down and up and down. The way the hadith says, to not pray like you're a rooster, just pecking at the ground, do you know? But you're in a place where there's consciousness as you're going through this. And every one of these things has a sense of consciousness to it. I gotta think about this and not undermine the mechanics, but recognize them as something that's important. In the Hanafi school, if a quarter 
if more than a quarter of a limb, a quarter or more, gets exposed, then that breaks the validity of the prayer. Does that make sense? In general of certain limbs, of the areas that essentially are your private parts, front and back, if those get exposed by like a really small amount, the size of a dirham, they say, then that also invalidates the prayer. The prayer doesn't count. But other limbs, which are going to be different for men and women, because what needs to be covered at a minimum is different for men and women. And we'll run through a list of what those things are. But if, for example, uh, a quarter now for like for the women, like because you're covered other than your hands, your face, and your feet. So when somebody says to you, like your hair is considered to be a part of this, your limbs, right? So when some sisters have like some hair sticking out, it's not a quarter of that limb. Do you get what I mean? So that doesn't invalidate the prayer in that sense. Does that make sense? But what happens now is if more than one limb is exposed, you have people who are going to have like a part of their wrist is exposed or their arm or their ankle or their neck or these things, the sum total of which, if it exceeds a quarter of what is the shortest limb, which for most people generally is the wrist to the forearm, that thing, if the sum total of that is exceeding a quarter, then that constitutes a breaking of the prayer, right? It's not what needs to be covered of the clothes. Does that make sense? Yeah? Are we sure? Yeah, so conceptually what you wanna think about, right? And this is not applicable like in a place to just any one particular gender, it's for both people. And more often than not, right? The people who do not dress the way they need to dress in prayer are guys. Like, they fundamentally don't. And it, it's, it's very serious because if your backside is popping out of your pants, you're breaking your prayer at that point in time, right? So just get, wear a belt, right? Get a t-shirt and tuck it into your pants, you know? But the clothes have to be loose. They have to be things that are also kind of mindful of like, I'm in a state of prayer. We don't want to like limit this to conversations that become devoid now of like cultural understandings. This is why we read Islam and the Cultural Imperative some weeks ago. If you didn't read it, you should read it. Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, you can Google it online. It'll come up in a PDF. You don't abandon your culture to become Muslim, right? Islam is not about committing a cultural apostasy. So wear like all the things that you want to wear and be in those things. We're talking about in the state of prayer, this isn't about I think, I feel, I want, so-and-so said this or that, but fundamentally the exercise has mechanics to it. And so if you're in a place where a quarter of what are these other limbs outside of what constitutes the kind of front and back side of our private areas, if those things are exposed a quarter or more, then that creates a problem, it invalidates the prayer. Does that make sense? And the sum total of multiple parts exceeding that also then, then becomes an invalidator of the prayer. So why we want to go back to just what you're wearing in point number two? <coughs> like just have an outfit that is your prayer outfit. Do you know what I mean? And be in a place where you're taking it with consideration as best as you can. So when you're getting to a place, you're trying your best, like you want to be mindful of it as you're readying yourself for the prayer and allowing for yourself to say, like this is a part of it. Do you know what I mean? This is something that goes into it, right? In the Hanafi school, you might hear some people say, well, for a woman, there's some exceptions made in the forearms. Right? Because of what we said before, certain tasks, certain jobs would require people to be engaged in such a way where their forearms would be exposed in some capacity. That's fine, even if you take that opinion, but in understanding everything else that goes into what this constitutes, I just want to be mindful of the time. Um, 
I want to get through the other things really quickly. So if we understand this point conceptually, the next week I can tell you like what the breakdown is of the lists of what each limb is um, so that you just have that. But you can also like Google like, you know, limbs in prayer, like aura, like what limbs need to be covered in prayer. You'll get a list of what those things are. Um, but just so we don't go too much over time, um, why don't we just go through these other things. Number five, the condition is that the prayer time must have entered and you have to have surety that the prayer time is on you, right? So you have all these apps that tell you when the prayer times start and finish. The way the prayers function for us are based off of a cyclical pattern of the sun. So if this is the horizon, essentially there's so much that goes into this religion that builds like an elemental relationship, right? Wudu is with water, right? The Qibla you can tell from the sun, the prayer times with the sun and the stars and the, the night and the moon and whatever else. The start and end of months through the moon, you know? You're not supposed to be just like stuck staring at a device. You're supposed to like engage the world around you and build a relationship with it. Do you know what I mean? So when you are in a place where you're trying to figure out the prayer times, you have these apps, you have all kinds of websites. They tell you these things. Don't look at them only when you're trying to pray that prayer, but preemptively, like understand, okay, this is when Fajr is starting. This is when Dhuhr is starting. This is when Asr is starting. This is when Maghrib is starting. It's when Isha is starting. There's a hadith where the prophet is asked, what is the best of actions? And he gives different answers to these questions in different narrations. But in one narration he says, prayer in its time and what's meant by that is not that you pray it right in the minute that it comes in but in the window of time that you have to pray it so if we look at Fajr what's happening is that the Sun is moving in its own movement cycle right and if this is the horizon when the Sun gets to different degree marks and you'll find different places I'm not trying to make it complicated, but you're gonna meet people in the United States who do all of these things. You just wanna be aware of it. You go to different mosques and they're gonna be giving you sometimes different start and end times to prayers. What they're doing it is based off of degree markings. So 18 degrees, 15 degrees, and 12 degrees. What the Quran says is that Fajr comes in at like true dawn, not a false dawn, that there's still something that looks like it's light visible above the horizon, but a true dawn when it's the actual light from the sun that's coming up. At 18 degrees, you have an indication of some type of light that is coming in. There's many people who would tell you just out of caution, you want to consider this to be the start time of Fajr. Then a lot more people are adopting like these degree marks of 15 degrees. But what's happening essentially as this is coming, the sun is rising. And as it rises, you're going to see different colors coming into the horizon. Right? So when the sun is at the 18 degree mark, that's when that sense of like whiteness starts to come. Do you know? And the sky looks a little bit blue in that kind of frame, right? And when you're on a plane, it's really amazing because if you're flying west from here, this way is not west, that way is west. If you're flying west from here, right, you can be in like a perpetual sunrise for a long time and you can see all of these magnificent colors as you're like above the clouds. It's really, really beautiful to, to witness. But Fudger is going to be in a place where the time for Fajr is going to be not when the sun is at any of these degree marks below the horizon, but when the light from the sun being in these positions is visible above the horizon. And when a portion of the sun now comes above the horizon, you can't pray in that window. That's when the time of Fajr stops. And it's going to go until, and then at that point, you're, you can't pray until the sun is completely above the horizon. So say you slept through Fajr, right? Which nobody's gonna do, right? But say you slept through Fajr, 
and you woke up like right at this point. One of the times that it's prohibited to pray is when a portion of the sun is above the horizon. Partially, you have to wait until the sun is fully above the horizon in order to pray again. Does that make sense? So the prayer time coming in, this is what those prayer times will be, right? So a lot of you, when you were fasting in Ramadan, you weren't starting your fast based off of this timing. You were starting your fast based off of this timing. But there's some messages you could have gone to where they prayed Fajr like 30 minutes before you were praying Fajr. And if you're like, what just happened here? It's because they're going by an 18 degree mark rather than a 15 degree mark. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's Fajr. The second prayer is called Dhuhr. And what happens with Dhuhr is when the sun is at its zenith, And the only part of the world where like the sun is going to be directly above you when it's at its high point at noon is if you're living on the equator, right? So for the rest of us, we don't live in the equator, right? We live north of the equator. If you go back to like sixth grade social studies or science or whatever class they taught you about the hemispheres and like quadrants of this and that, whatever, you know. I don't know if you guys do this in your school or not. If you know what grade it is, because I don't remember what grade it's in. I'm an English teacher, Ron. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Our children's future is very <laughs> So what's happening here, when the sun is at its zenith, you're going to have a period that is about five minutes before and after. It's called the Zawal time. This is another time where there's no prayer. The prayer for Dhuhr starts after this, the sun starts to descend from its zenith. And so to just be cautious, five to ten minutes is a window. Five before, five after, maybe <coughs> like six. You just don't pray in that. So when you're in your prayer time app or on the websites, it's going to give you the time that you can start to pray. Like we have people that show up at Juma here, for example, and they walk in and they just start praying something. And I have to remind them, like, the time for Dhuhr right now is later than what it was before daylight savings time. So that prayer, if you're praying in that time, it's not a time where the prayer count. Like you can't pray in that time. Does that make sense? So you have now... From Dhuhr time till when Asr comes in, the third prayer of the day. In the Hanafi school, there's two opinions on this. That Asr starts when your shadow is one times its length, or your shadow is two times its length, right? So why are these things relevant? Because here, when you want to know Fajr starts, like look at the color of the sky and see what's going on there. And you'll be able to tell if Fajr's in. For Dhuhr, you want to look at your shadow, right? If we lived in a place where the sun was directly above us, then at its zenith, you'd have no shadow. Does that make sense? Yeah? Right now, because we don't, right? We live north of the equator. There's going to be like a little shadow because the sun is not directly above us. The sun is going to be just slightly like angled in a way. But you're going to know like that's when Dhuhr comes in. So you're stuck in the wilderness. You don't have cell phone service. Like, what do I do? Right? Well, you just start to engage in a deeper relationship with the world that's around you. And you pay attention to the signs that are there. So you're looking at it and it's okay. Like as my shadow now starts to increase as the sun is going down. When Asr comes in, there's two opinions in the Hanafi school. When your shadow is one time its length or twice the size of its length. It's the mid-afternoon, right? So here's where you have Asr. You can pray Dhuhr anytime in this window. You have that whole chunk of time to pray Dhuhr. And then Asr goes until the time of Maghrib, which is at sunset. 
So you have that whole time to pray Maghrib. And then Isha is when the sky is dark enough, you know, it's nighttime, stars. You know what I mean? All of these things are in like your, your phones. You have computers in your pockets, you know? But don't engage it mindlessly because as an apparatus, it's quite often something we just scroll through. So if you get to a place when you wake up tomorrow and you're like, every day I have to check the time of prayer, why is it hard for me to remember when it's only a minute different from the day before, right? So if you're engaging the apparatus in that way, then you're already removing a part of developing the consciousness that comes from the act because you're a little bit more present in it. So like sit and be still. So you're not just looking at it or the app like has the adhan go off and you don't even know what the time of day is, but you like take a breath, right? We're going to talk about the call to prayer and what happens when it's made and what we do in relation to it. But all of it's about like centering yourself and getting to a place where the prayer isn't meant to create hecticness. It's meant to create ease. You know what I mean? And these are things when you start to get them down, they are pretty easy um, to just start to maneuver. So you want to be kind to yourself, right? If you've never looked at the sun before and understood like its relation to you, in that way, so it's going to take time to adapt to get to that place. Does that make sense? Any questions on the prayer time having must being entered? Uh, just when the, the transition between uh, Asr and Maghrib, that's also forbidden time, right? After you pray Asr, you've prayed Asr, like you don't pray anything until Maghrib comes in. Yeah, Zaklokhya. But also when the sun is, um, is descending. Said, Unless you haven't prayed Asr. Oh, okay. Right? If you didn't pray Asr, you got to pray Asr. But if you prayed Asr, you're not going to pray again until the time of Maghrib is coming, which still includes what you're saying, that descending time. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, no. Once you pray Asr, there's no prayer with a prostration. If there's a janaza, a funeral prayer, which we'll talk about in a few weeks, you could pray that. But um, he wouldn't pray like extra prayers at that point. Yeah. Yeah, question. Yeah. Um, is there like an app that you recommend? Yeah. There, you go to website islamicfinder.com. It'll tell you like with your location on. Um, but you'd have to keep your location on for it to be accurate. Do you know? Uh, and it'll just give you the windows of time. And you could use that. I would use that. Some of these apps. Um, like we're selling data and privacy information so just be mindful of that there's one called Muslim Pro that was like very popular and it um, came out that they were selling people's data to government um, so don't use that one <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah 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 delete that one very good thanks yeah um, so like in the plane is there a way for you to we're going to talk about the Qibla next, facing the Qibla. Does anybody else have questions praying? Yeah. Is the Maghrib, Maghrib time valid until Isha, or is there a shorter window there? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different opinions on that, but you should try to pray Maghrib, you know, within, like, the earlier part of Maghrib. Yeah, yeah. And there's a question about the Adhan, so we can get to it later. But my question is, if you're in a space like this or a masjid where someone will probably make the adhan if there's people here, can you still make your sunnah prayers when the time comes in if the adhan hasn't been called? Yeah. What would happen also is that people would pray their sunnahs at home. Right. Right? And there was right. a lot of reasons for that, you know? Um, that whole notion that there's not like a high bar of entry to mm -hmm. Islam it's not that you're discouraged to pray in a prayer room, but the idea also isn't that you would set a standard that is, um, this is the norm necessarily, you know? So there's gonna be some people who they're doing the bare minimum, and we don't, ours is not like a religion that's, let's be in competition with each other, but to give people this idea also that like, you're not a bad person if you are where you are, do you know what I mean? Um, and you're not in competition with somebody else. And so you pray, you'd see people pray their sunnahs at home. If you're not going home, you pray your sunnahs here, right? 
And we have a nice community, alhamdulillah, for the most part, right? Yeah. Delay it means don't push it after the window. So, so, like, so I know I think like after the window, it's like the like, time, like what is time for us is it like an hour or like two hours? You can pray Asr, you can pray Dhuhr in any time in that window. And people who use words, right? And you want to be careful too when you're telling people about things, when you use words like better or worse. They're taking it as obligatory and haram when that's not what it means, do you know? So if you have the capacity to do certain things, like yeah, you can go pray in the masjid five times a day, go pray in the masjid five times a day, right? Can everybody pray in the masjid five times a day? No. Does it? Somebody says, it's better for you to pray in the masjid five times a day, like maybe you can make that statement, right? But the person hearing it might be in a place where they're like, I have to, no matter what, do this, you know? And it ruins people's lives because we're not conscious of how our words are actually being heard when we're saying to somebody, this is better, or I heard that's better, or this is better. Better doesn't mean that it's an obligation or it's worse doesn't mean it's a prohibition. Do you, do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? So you can pray in the window of time, you know? And for people who are working, people who are in school, those are like very important things to know. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, okay. Facing the Qibla is a condition also. So you're going to face towards the Kaaba. You're going to face towards Mecca. In the Hanafi school, you have the leeway of not of, of 45 degrees in each direction after you've done your best, right? So it's not just, I'm going to stand in like a random way. But for example, like... A lot of us have apps on our phone. If you don't have certain things turned on on your phone, or your phone also is using an app that gets thrown off by like certain things, like there's people that come in here all the time and they turn on their phones, they're like, hey, the Qibla is that way. I'm like, no, man, it's not. And they're like, no, it is. I'm like, it can fundamentally cannot be, right? Like, look at where the sun sets and look at where the sun rises, right? The sun. Like, what part, what direction does the sun set in? Huh? Yeah, and what's that, what direction does it rise in? Right? We know this. Do you know what I mean? So if you just pay attention to the sun, and you see where it's setting over there, and it looks beautiful, and you see where it's rising over there, if the sun sets over there in the west, right? And west is that way, then that means east is this way, and north is this way, then northeast cannot be this way, right? Do you, you see what I'm saying? And when people are like, but the phone says that it's that way. And you're like, well, the sun is right there and it sets in the west, right? So you want to just build that relationship elementally again, because it can be a check, for example, because sometimes people's phones are off because of like magnetization of things. Sometimes if you're wary of like turning on your location, or Bluetooth is necessary for certain apps. It throws things off substantially. Um, but you want to try your best. So trying your best means what? Like, talk to people who are of the community you go to. They're praying, and they probably know what they're doing, you know? So you talk to them and say, hey, like, I'm in the middle of some place I've never been before, and we're not in a prayer space, we're praying outside, like, how do you pray in your hometown? What's the direction? It's cloudy, I can't see the sun. They'll be able to give you insight. You see what I mean? But you're doing your due diligence. You're not just like, gonna do eeny, meeny, miny, mo and feel like, well, that's just the way that, that I did it. Google has a, online um, what they call their Qibla Finder, and they're pretty accurate. Like they do, theirs is pretty good, and it's Google, so they're also just like a beast at all things technologically. So it's something you'd want to maybe like kind of use if you're looking for an app. So what happens is if you're in Mecca, and here's the Kaaba in front of you, regardless of where it is you're praying around it, you're gonna know what direction to pray in. Fun fact, if you're praying inside the Kaaba, then you can face wherever you want to. 
You don't have to face any particular direction. So if one day you go and somebody lets you pray inside the Kaaba, just pick and choose anything. But we're all facing the direction of the Kaaba when we pray. So what happens in the Hanafi school is that when this is in your line of sight, there's no excuse. Like this has to be what you face towards, right? It's right in front of you. And when you leave from the masjid, how many of you have ever been to Mecca before? Yeah, great. So when you leave from the masjid, what happens is the area around the masjid, there's tiles that are also directionally facing the Kaaba. So you know just based off of that. Just like you could go into a prayer room and in ours, like these lines face towards the direction of the Kaaba. So what happens when you don't have the Kaaba in plain sight, you are given a leeway in the Hanafi school after you've tried your best, where you've gone through these steps and now we're over here in New York and we are trying to face the Kaaba you have a leeway of 45 degrees in either direction after you've tried your best to figure out the direction of the Kaaba. Does that make sense? So it's a 90 degree angle, but 45 degrees off in either direction. If you find out after you did all of those things and you completed the prayer that you weren't praying in the right direction, you don't have to repeat that prayer. The prayer still counts. Because you went through your due diligence, but you got to be oriented towards the Kaaba, towards Mecca. And then the last condition is that you have to have an intention um, for the prayer, right? Because the intention is made prior to the prayer. It's not made when you're in the prayer itself. This is an intention that's made in the heart. It can be verbalized. Some spaces you go to they might like express this outwardly in some way but this is something you're saying within yourself um, you're intending to pray the prayer and when you're intending the prayer you're intending like the specific of the prayer so for example the only difference and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks at Fajr time there's two recommended units of prayer two sunnah prayers and two obligatory units of prayer two fard prayers the only difference in those two units from one another is the intention that you make when you make them. So in one, you're going to make an intention of two cycles of prayer, two rak'ahs of prayer that are sunnah for fajr. And in the other, you're going to make two units that are fard. And they're prayed exactly the same way. Does that make sense? So that intention is something that is important. And those are then the conditions of the prayer outside of the prayer right S these seven things are what's going to be necessary for one who is entering into a state of prayer does that make sense okay i'm sorry that took a lot longer than i thought it would i didn't i don't know if like i anticipated mugger being shorter than it was so i apologize for that i hope it wasn't too exhausting or tiring if you guys want to sit on it a bit and then come with other questions that you might have next week. Um, but just build a relationship with these things, right? Especially those of you who are new to it, you're trying to understand how it is, right? It's not something that you just on day one are going to have perfection with, nor even perhaps maybe on day a thousand. You wanna just try your best with them. But you want to be aware of what they are in detail so that as the mechanics are things you become accustomed to, like any exercise, this is spiritual exercise, you want to be able to adapt to it as best as you can by having a familiarity and then building a relationship with each so that it's elevating the inward state of the prayer as much as it can. Yeah? Okay. So why don't we take a pause here. Um, let me see what time the show starts. Uh, so Isha is going to come in in like 15 minutes if people um, want to stick around for that.
uh, we can pray together. Um, if you need to head out, feel free. So next week, what we'll start to do is talk about the actual mechanics of the prayer. So you remember how when we talked about wudu, we talked about what was obligatory in the wudu and what were recommended parts to the wudu, right? Um, so for example, your mouth and your nose, the number of times, the order, these are all recommended things um, outside of the other things that are just obligatory. And we looked at the verse that named these things, right? So we want to know what are the obligations. You want to know what are kind of the necessary and what are recommended. Because there might be times when you have like a short window of time to pray, right? And you have to complete the prayer. You don't want to do it in a way where you're adding stress because you're going through every single part because you don't know the distincting parts to it. Or like you're new to Islam, you know, you're just getting familiar with it. You don't want to create burden for yourself thinking that somehow you're going to know an entirely new language as soon as you say the Shahada. So as you're building a relationship with it, you're building a relationship with the words and what is obligatory is going to be a first step and then what is kind of beyond that is a second step. Do you, do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? So we're going to get into that next week and then we'll just keep going from there. All right. Assalamu We'll see everyone next week. Then. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>